Welcome to the Cohen Veterans Bioscience Webinar Series. This is a monthly program sponsored by Cohen Veterans Bioscience for the brain research and systems biology communities. Cohen Veterans Bioscience is a nonprofit research alliance whose mission is to transform research in veterans' mental health through translational research. We are focused on understanding the molecular underpinnings of diseases such as PTSD and TBI to develop better treatments and diagnostics. Before I introduce today's speaker, let me walk you through some logistics. This program is being recorded and will be archived in the Cohen Veterans Bioscience YouTube channel and website. The presentation will be approximately 45 minutes in length to allow time for Q&A afterwards. Please use the Q&A feature to post a question and we will pose the question to the presenter. Today our speaker is Dr. Martin Michelle. Dr. Michelle is a physician trained in experimental and clinical pharmacology in Essen, Germany and San Diego, California. He headed the Nephrology and Hypertension Research Laboratory in Essen, the Department of Pharmacology and Pharmacotherapy at the University of Amsterdam and was global head of product and pipeline scientific support at Beringer Engelheim. Since 2012, he has been professor of pharmacology at the Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz, Germany. He has published more than 500 scientific articles, has been editor-in-chief of Archives of Pharmacology, and serves on the board of many pharmacologic, physiologic, and neurologic journals. His research focuses on experimental and clinical receptor pharmacology in the autonomic nervous systems, particularly with regard to cardiovascular and neurogenital systems. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Michelle, who will speak on the reproducibility crisis in science and how to address it. Dr. Michelle. Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning for those on the West Coast. Um, it's my pleasure to be with you today. And if you see Apollo 13 on the first slide, that has multiple reasons. First of all, I think it's a really cool movie. Second, used to we have a problem, has become iconic for identifying that you really have a major problem at hand, which needs immediate and full attention. And as you'll see later on in the presentation, I'll be coming back to the Apollo 13 team theme. So what will I talk about today? I will talk about a range of things about trust, about God, smelly t-shirts, and Elvis. So if that doesn't convince you, I don't know what could convince you. So please stay tuned. Trust is a very fundamental element in how we as humans interact with each other. The question is, whom shall we trust? Is it politicians, used car dealers, lawyers? Or if you allow me saying that as Germans, would you trust Volkswagen when buying a diesel car? Well, most of those groups are not that well trusted. But nonetheless, we expect that we, each other, and society at large, trust us because we are scientists. Trust is really fundamental. We design our experiments based on data from investigators and journals we trust. And we choose our collaboration partners based on trust. To illustrate this point, I'm showing data from a small study that a master student of mine, Marjan Amiri, has done two years ago. She asked 134 preclinical academic investigators which personality traits they expect in collaboration with someone from the pharmaceutical industry. And what you see are eight different traits here on the slide. And the green bar represents what they found extremely important. And as you can see, the second to right is trustworthiness. That had by far the greatest bar for extremely important and for the sum of extremely and very important. Factors such as scientific qualification or transparent information sharing scored much less in what people found to be important. And whether someone was frankly, frankly, they didn't give a damn. Don't forget 
all the charity and taxpayer funding science is receiving is based on trust in the general public that what we are doing is meaningful and will have uh, an impact on how we live together. So as Americans, you all know that every single bill, every coin says in God we trust. And the civil engineer and grandfather of statistical analysis, William Atwood Stemming, extended this by saying, in God we trust, all others must bring data. And that has become the battle cry of the evidence-based medicine movement. So can we trust the published data? Many of you will hear, have heard about the engine paper where they looked at 53 preclinical studies and found 89% not to be reproducible. Colleagues from Bayer Healthcare um, did a similar survey based on another therapeutic area, and they found 78% of the studies they looked at not to be reproducible. Meanwhile, three other groups have done similar efforts, and they come up with somewhat smaller numbers of about 50% not being reproducible. But even if Throughout the five studies, you take the smallest values, you can I say with great confidence that at least 50% of preclinical studies are irreproducible. And that's a frightening number. If you consider that the US spends annually about 56 billion on preclinical research, and 50% of that is non reproducible, it means that at least 28 billion of US dollars are wasted based on irreproducibility in the US alone. Let that number sink in for a moment. If there were no irreproducible studies being funded, approval rates of the NIH could double. Whew, that's a big one. And actually, these 28 billions we are wasting every single year, and that's just the US, is more than the cost for the entire Apollo 13 mission. The general public has taken notice. Funders, be it NIH or, for example, in the UK, the Wellcome Trust, politicians in US Congress or the general public have taken note. When is the last time that you saw a general public magazine such as The Economist running a cover story on scientific data, in this case on the reproducible crisis in science? And that actually happened as early as 2013 after the first reports had come out. The NIH is very concerned and one of the examples for this would be this editorial piece published in Nature by Francis Collins. So what are the root causes for the lack of reproducibility in preclinical science? One of the things first coming to mind is fraud. However, outright fraud is considered to be a minor component only. A big component certainly is a lack of detail in the methods section of published papers, which makes replication difficult. That can be missing information on the strain, gender, and age of animals, lack of verification of the cell line being used, of the lack of disclosure of the antibodies being used, lack of blinding randomization and sample size calculations, no information on incubation time and volume of a biochemical assay, the data analysis approaches, and the list goes on and on. Journals are in part to blame for that because for a long time, method section got neglected in journals. But they are catching up. The question is, is this enough? The answer is most likely not because some of those earlier studies I mentioned looking into lack of reproducibility have actually collaborated with the original investigators in their attempt to reproduce the findings. And even in such collaboration, they could not reproduce many of the published findings. 
A big problem are the unknown unknowns. Even if you report everything in great detail, what you have done, relevant parameters may not be noticed. An example that has received quite some um, publicity is a paper by Sorge um, reporting on the outcome of analgesia studies in rats. And they found that the smell of a worn t-shirt was enough to affect the outcomes of an analgesia experiment. Actually, it was males only. And we know males shower less frequently than females. Be that how it may, it's likely that many such factors exist and they are the unknown unknowns. The only approach that can address those is randomization. It's not a magic bullet, but it's the only thing we have to address the unknown unknowns. There is a general tendency, and those of you who work in the newer science are familiar with that, that the human mind finds what it wishes to find. An interesting example of this is work from Emily Senna, now at Edinburgh in Scotland. And she already looked a decade ago at about 290 animal studies and looked at whether they reported a positive, a neutral, or a negative outcome. And separated them by randomization and blinding. What came out of this analysis is that the probability for having a neutral study more than tripled when randomization or blinding were applied, meaning that you have had bias if you didn't randomize or blind it. This is nothing about fraud. This is nothing about hiding data or suppressing negative data. This is just our, our, our own mind is fooling us. Another example for this also comes from the group at Edinburgh, in this case with Malcolm McLeod, the um, first author of the paper. There was a compound that some of you may have heard of, it's NXY059, which was an experimental anti-stroke compound. Preclinical studies have been pretty good However, the clinical trials failed. And what you see on this graph is the percent of reduction in infarct volume um, with the drug as compared to non-drug. And if in the upper left panel, you look at randomized versus non-randomized studies, you can see that the reduction was considerably smaller, actually about a third only, if the study was randomized, it was about half only if the study was concealed. So randomization and blinding makes a real difference in the reporting of scientific data. That group went on and took a sample of 2000 random publications related to preclinical CNS work. And they looked how the reporting of risk factors has evolved over time. In the upper left panel, you see the prevalence of reporting randomization in the papers. And from the early 1990s to the 2008 to 2011 period, that has increased. However, the increase is very limited. It went up from about 18 to a little over 30% of papers. If we proceed at that pace, we will still have many papers not reporting on randomization by the year 2100. And the same applies for blinding. Another important question is sample size calculation. I'll come to that. A question which hasn't had so much attention yet, but as you can see, really, the number of studies reporting of that is almost non-existent. If the community realizes that reporting certain things are important, improvement can achieved. And as an example, you see in the lower right-hand column, a reporting of conflict of interest, which has increased markedly from just 3% of papers to 30% in the latest period. And of course, 30% is still low, but that is a really steep increase. And that's what we need to see for other aspects of preclinical science. 
To summarize this part, lack of randomization and blinding are important sources of bias. Randomization and blinding have long become standard in clinical research. They should also be applied to non-clinical research as much as possible. Actually, many scientists I know, and I belong to that crowd, so I'm free to say that, have for quite a while thought themselves intellectually superior to their clinical colleagues. Actually, if you belong to this group, shouldn't you be embarrassed that clinicians have developed more sophisticated approaches to research than scientists? Another big chunk of the problem is the inappropriate use of statistics. Inappropriate use and interpretation of statistical tests is seen as a key cause of lack of reputabilities. There are multiple issues with that. For example, ignoring whether you are dealing with parametric or non-parametric data that is normally distributed or non, um, applying t-tests for comparing more than two groups without multiple comparison adjustments, or generally a poor understanding of the concept of the p-value. So I would like to go a little bit more into that. The p-value tells us the probability that a given group difference would have been observed by chance if the samples had been selected randomly from the same group. And the buzzword here really is randomly. That means a p-value is only meaningful if all other factors other than the primary variable are randomly distributed among groups. Some investigating-induced violation of the randomness principles have been summarized as p-hacking, and the reference given at the bottom of this paper um, nicely explains the issue of p-hacking. Let me explain to you what that is. P-hacking is any change in experimental or analysis strategy after initial results have been seen. Of course, there may be a need to change your experimental or analysis strategy after initial results have been seen. But the proper way to deal with that is starting a new series or not performing statistical tests. That includes an increase in sample size, a post hoc change in parameter to be analyzed, a post hoc decision for data normalization, a post hoc decision to use an alternative statistical test, or a post hoc decision which outlier should be removed, not based on preset criteria, but set on, well, if I take off this one, then we'll get the right p-value. All of these induce bias for finding a difference, even if it is not there, and for exaggerated effect sizes. Let me give you some examples of that. Imagine you have done six measurements and got a p-value pretty close to the magical dot 05, that is here, 0 0.055. So you say, okay, let's do two more and then it'll get significant. I've heard that quite frequently and I must admit, in the past, I have applied that. Um, however, the new NS8 is biased by the trend seen in NS6 and no longer represents a random sample. Another example, the group difference has a p-value of somewhat more than 0 0.05, so you retest the data on a logarithm scale or you switch to another test. There's nothing wrong with log normalization of your data and it may even be required when data only are normally distributed on a log scale. But a post hoc decision to switch from the data as they were to log normalized data is a violation of the randomness principle. A final example, the decision to use parametric versus non-parametric or paired versus non-paired t-test must be made a priori. If you change the test you apply to your data post hoc, you introduce bias. Each statistical test carries its own set of assumptions. 
as investigator, you're largely free to do what you wish, but if you change it after you've seen the data, you're no longer talking about randomness. What it all boils down to is p-values aren't trophies. The asterisk above the data point looks nice and may be necessary to get the paper accepted. An asterisk resulting from p-hacking, however, makes data less meaningful, possibly even invalid. Science is about answering meaningful questions. Papers are a tool for this, but they are not the primary goal, although it may look that way if you're just up for a promotion committee. David Kalkun, actually 45 years ago in his lectures on biostatistics, already wrote, the function of significance test is to prevent you from making a fool of yourself and not to make unpublishable results publishable. I always like Dilbert, so I let this sink in for a couple of seconds, what Dilbert feels about making up numbers and what they mean. So let's get back to what a p-value does and does not mean. As I said, a p-value reports the probability of seeing a difference as large as you observed or larger, even if the two samples came from a population with the same mean. In contrast to common perception, the p-value does not tell us the probability that an observed finding is true. That's a fundamental difference. A p-value is about probabilities. It's not about truth. And that brings us to the concept of the false discovery rate, abbreviated as FDR. Even if everything has been done by the book, you're randomized, you're blinded, you have provided a detailed method description, there was no p-hacking, a significant finding may not be true. Poor robustness, even of a properly designed studies, was predicted as early as 2005 in a seminal paper by John Ioannidis, uh, for which I'm giving the reference below. The underlying concept was later termed the false discovery rate by David Kalkun. Let me explain what that is. You probably all are familiar with the concept of a positive predictive value which we apply when we want to develop a new diagnostic tests. The PPV describes the probability that a real effect exists if a significant result has been obtained. The FDR is exactly the opposite of that. It's the probability that a real effect does not exist if a significant result has been obtained. So PPV and FDR are flip sides of the same coin. Or, if you prefer this in mathematical terms, the FDR is 100 minus the PPV, and the PPV is 100 minus the FDR. A practical example given by David Kuhn. In the screen, let's assume your condition that has has a prevalence of 1% in the population you're looking at. And actually a based a actual test for mild cognitive impairment. So if it's 1% prevalence in the population, out of 10,000 people you test, 100 have the condition. And the test you're running has a sensitivity of 0.8 and a specificity of 0.95. And those of you who have been working with diagnostic tests know that this is a pretty good test for screening purposes. If your sensitivity is 0.8 out of the 100 people really having the 80 are detected as true positive tests. And 20%, so in this case 20, are false negative tests. Of greater relevance is, 99% of the population in this case do not have the condition. And if your specificity is 0.95, that sounds really great, but what does it mean? It means that out of those 9,900 subjects not having the condition, 
in 9,405 cases, you get indeed a negative test, and that's true negative. However, if 5% of the patients not having the conditions with a specificity of 0.95 will yield a positive test, and that's 495. In other words, in the total population of 10,000 people, you got 575 positive tests, of which 495 are falsely positive. That is an FDR of 86%. Put yourself in the shoes of a patient or a family member um, of someone tested for early Alzheimer's and they're giving a positive test results and in 86% of cases that is untrue. I think that's almost cruel. Let's go to another example where the probability that the test is actually positive or true is somewhat greater. In this case, there is a real effect in 10% of the tests. It's the same type of calculation. In this case, we applied a power of 80% and a significant level of 5%. Standard approaches in biomedical science. Again, if there was no effect and the significance level was set as 0.05, 5% positive tests will occur in the 900 that actually do not represent a real issue. So you have 45 false positive tests, which in this specific example is a false discovery rate of 36%. If everything had been done by the book. So John Ioannidis had already run a number of permutations of this where he systematically varied the power um, of the statistical approach based on sample size variance and effect sizes, the true ratio of true, not true relationship and bias. Bias caused by things such as lack of blinding, lack of randomization and so on. What you can see here, the positive predicted value is pretty high, 85%. If your statistical power was high, the a priori probability for an effect was high and the bias was low. However, the positive predicted value drops from 85 to less than 0.2% if the power was low, the a priori probability was low, and there was some degree of bias. To get away from these numbers, which are the really the scientific basis, generally a high false discovery rate is driven by three factors. It's poor statistical power, which can come from small effect size, a small sample size, and large variance, and how these three interact. The second driver of a high false discovery rate is low prior probability. And the third main driver is design and observer bias. Let me again use the words of David Kuhn to comment on that. He wrote in a more recent paper, a P of 0 0.05 means nothing more than worth another look. If you want to avoid making a fool of yourself very often, do not regard anything greater than p smaller 0 0.001 as a demonstration that you've discovered something. Well, this 0 0.001 has to be taken with a grain of salt, but I think you get the overall message. This p-value of 0 0.05 is really not a trustworthy indication that you have really discovered something. So what should a robust study look like? Let's get back to Science 101. What is science all about? You have an important question. You search for existing data, perform a knowledge gap analysis, perhaps generate some exploratory data. Based on that, you develop and then test the newly derived hypothesis. And the outcome of this is integrated into existing knowledge. So what does that mean for the ideal study or a manuscript describing this? 
In general terms, a given study or manuscript may actually include exploratory and confirmatory hypothesis testing parts. Both are important parts of what scientists do and should do, but it's important that you clearly and transparently define whether your study or which parts of your study are exploratory and which are testing a pre-specified hypothesis, i.e. in statistical terms are confirmatory. Randomization and blinding should be applied as much as possible. Report methods with sufficient details to allow a skilled person to redo the study. When reporting your findings, focus on effect sizes with confidence intervals based on what is assumed to be biologically meaningful. I was recently reviewing a manuscript and the investigators reported that upon a certain treatment, body weight of their rats decreased significantly and they had a p-value of 0 0.04. That looked strange to me because from that treatment, I hadn't expected that at all. So I looked at the actual number and body weight of these rats, for those of you not working with rats regularly, normally a rat weighs around 300 grams, body weight difference between the two groups was one gram. Basically, hardly any of us can weigh a rat as long as it's alive that precisely. So even if it have, may have been statistically significant, that was a bullshit number. It didn't mean anything. If they had reported effect sizes, that would have been obvious to begin with and would not have required going back to the original data to understand that. Generally, provide as much granularity in data reporting as possible. For example, a scatter plot is much more informative of a than a bar graph. I have a few more recommendations, and the next set is specific for exploratory studies. Let me emphasize, exploratory studies are not second grade science. They equally are important. And a very fine example of that is the paper referenced in the lower left corner by Ulen, published in Science last year. It's a purely explorative study, but it's one of the most useful papers I've seen in years. In case you haven't looked at that paper, I strongly recommend you to do so. What they have done is they're taking about 30 human tissues, three to six samples of different donors for each tissue, and then they, with a highly standardized, highly quantitative method, looked at mRNA expression of every single human gene. And they did the same for more than 20 cell lines. So the most important part of the paper actually is the online supplement, including an Excel file, which has 56 megabytes. So it takes some time to download. But once you have it, you can really, on a sample by sample basis, look at in which human tissue your gene of interest is expressed. There is no real science behind it. It's purely exploratory, but it's tremendously useful. So wisely, Ulan and colleagues did not apply hypothesis testing statistical tests to these data. And if you do that, it can be done in a descriptive manner. But remember, the more parameters you test, the more often you will find one being significantly different, just by chance. If you really had a pre-specified hypothesis, then you, there's a much bigger point for reporting p-values. However, that is only meaningful if you have pre-specified the null hypothesis, the sample size, and the sample size should be developed based on effect size considered biologically meaningful. And remember, a small sample size and a small effect size are key drivers of the false discovery rate. And a sample size of less than five is rarely meaningful, but that doesn't mean that anything with NS5 is meaningful. And of course, you need to pre-specify your measurement and analytical approach. In other words, do not apply any form of p-hacking. So is that too much to ask? And when talking about these ideas in the past, 
I frequently got replies such as, we've always done it like this and everyone else is doing it. And that reminded me about the first Elvis Greatest Hits album. It was released back in 1959, the year I was born, so I only learned about it afterwards. Um, and at that time, Elvis was still considered controversial because he was considered too indecent to be accepted as a mainstream artist. So the record label had the idea of naming the album 50 million Elvis fans can't be wrong. Well, there is no scientific value in that statement. It's as, as meaningful as telling people eat shits, 50 billion flies can't be wrong. So my answer to this criticism is exactly. That's why we now are in big trouble. So how can we get out of this other than each of us trying to implement um, the recommendations I've given earlier on as much as possible? I'd like to tell you about a couple of initiatives in the field. There is a journal editor initiative. Various pharmacology journals have agreed on a list of 12 items as common reporting standards. And this list has been endorsed by the major scientific publishing houses, Elsevier, Springer, Nature, and Wiley. And we are currently seeking support and buy-in from the top 100 pharmacology journals. There's also an initiative by the International Union of Pharmacology, which is the umbrella society of all the national pharmacology societies. And they are developing guidelines for best practice and study design, data analysis and reporting. And I have the honor and pleasure of heading this committee. <clears throat> there are also new approaches how to address that. And the Innovative Medicines Initiative in the European Union has actually launched a project on reproducibility with a budget of about 9 million euro. And finally, there is the organization I'm representing, PASS, the Partnership for the Assessment and Accreditation of Scientific Practice. So I want to spend the final two or three minutes in telling you what PASS is and does. Our mission is to reduce operational risk in areas of applied biomedical science where research results have direct or indirect commercial value and have an impact on competition that can be institutional, for example, in a pharmaceutical company, but also personally for your lab. We consider ourselves a pioneer in building a research quality governance system. So what we do is we identify questionable research practice and support efforts to build good research standards. What we clearly do not do is judge on the science itself or help you find a good project to work on or to invest in. Our, pro our approach is direct. We evaluate the data where they are collected. It's independent. We provide unbiased judgment. It's relative as we compare what we see in your lab or institution compared to what we have seen in others. And it's continuous with the aim to trigger and guide improvement. The central choose we are applying for that is the passport quality label. It delivers an expert stand statement about the probability that a given set of preclinical data is robust enough to support a successful drug discovery project. To give you an idea, the way to this passport certificate is a six step process. Um, and the key element of this is the on site visit designed to allow direct interaction and feedback with our customers. And that leads to our report and if desired to improvement um, and solutions and if needed to revisit later on. The passport addresses potential sources of bias related to study design, analysis, personnel, competition, financial and time pressure and goes way beyond the conventional due diligence. It's competent and efficient workflow based on the expert working with us 
having a vast industry experience at a range of pharmaceutical companies. Our customers are diverse businesses, investors, CROs, pharma and biotech companies, academia, and funders. The profile of our customers are those who rely on data from non-regulated research, make decisions at risk, need confidence in external partners, and can afford a failure-tolerating culture. If you wish to have more information, please see our website. Finally, I want to come back to William Edward Stemming, another of his quotes, and he was as prolific in good quotes as Yogi Berra. It's not necessary to change. Survival is not mandatory. And with that, I thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to address any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Michelle. You have certainly thrown out a lot of controversial statements that I hope will get us some questions. And I, I'd like to think survival is mandatory. <laughs> so let me take a second and see if we're getting any questions, because it'll take a while, I'm sure, for them to come in. <coughs> Can everybody hear me? And as I said earlier, if you come up with questions later on, or if you're watching this webinar later on on the YouTube channel, the first slide has my email address and please feel free to send me any questions or comments you may have afterwards. So far there's none. I'm going to give it just a little bit longer to see if we get some questions. And then if not, hopefully you will get a flood of them afterwards on your email. <laughs> Okay, so while we're waiting, let me share something else. Um, about a year ago, um, I looked back at the last 10 original studies my lab has produced and published. And I must say, very frankly and openly, that none of the last 10 studies we published be before 2014 would be optimal based on the criteria mentioning this presentation. So if you have the feeling that some of the things I said are just too far out there because you have done them in the past, it's something that I fully admit also have not done in the past, but I've seen the light and I hope you will too. <laughs> well, thank you. I hope you don't see the light too permanently. <laughs> I don't think we're getting any questions. So with that, I just want to thank you very much for your time and for a really interesting and mind-stimulating presentation. And I have a feeling you'll be getting a lot of questions by email. I look forward to that. Thank you thank for giving you. me the opportunity. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.